My name is Seth Meisler. I'm uh, from Finance Financial. Welcome you here for this event on passionate pursuits, uh, hobbies, collections. My role is to uh, give the introduction to tonight and introduce our moderator as well as our panelists. I thought I'd start with a story, a story of a guy named John J. Pittman. He was not a wealthy man to begin with, but he built a vast and famous coin collection. I uh, accomplished this feat by studying relentlessly and shrewdly investing a large percentage of his limited income as a middle manager at Eastman Kodak and his wife's income as a school teacher. In 1954, he mortgaged his house to travel to Egypt and bid on coins at the King Farouk collection auction. John sacrificed his and his family's lifestyle over the course of many decades. And he passed away in 1996 with uh, apparently no regrets and his long-suffering family justly received the benefits of his efforts when the collection was sold at auction for over $30 million. <laughs> so why did he do it? Why, why do we collect things from baseball cards to Barbie dolls, comic books to race cars? Some people collect for investment, yet you have to wonder how a penny can become worth thousands of dollars. Some collect for pure enjoyment, it's fun. Some collect to expand their social lives, attending swap meets and exchanging information. Uh, one collector of historical documents said that he collects because it's due to a genetic defect. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe uh, collecting is a, a human instinct and we collect for knowledge and to learn, for relaxation and stress reduction, for pleasure, for social interaction. Maybe for the desire to control, possess, uh, bring order to a small world. Maybe it's nostalgia, something that we grew up with or we saw that our parents had. Maybe it's for accumulation and for diversification of wealth. None of these motives are mutually exclusive and maybe these collectors receive all of these and more. And tonight we have an opportunity to discuss those collections, whether we collect ourselves or maybe we were the fortunate or unfortunate recipients of someone else's collection. <laughs> so our panelists today that we have here, and what I'll do is I'll introduce the panelists and the moderator, and then we'll let each panelist um, talk about themselves, about how they got into their collection or of what they're doing or their expertise with regards to that. So first we have Sharon Zweibaum, um, and she is a public art expert, a gallery administrator, museum lecturer and fine art collector. Next, we have Bill Norberg, and he's an owner of Golden Valley Stamps and Coins, so expert on both areas, stamps and coins. We have Phil Rosenblum, who's managing director and insurance advisor with Barron's Management Group. He is an artist and collector of art, and can also talk about insuring uh, collections. And then we have Brad Frank, an estate and corporate planning lawyer at Barnes and Thornburg and can talk about some of the legal and estate planning aspects, certain things he may have seen for people who either are uh, trying to decide what to do with their collection or beneficiaries of collections and situations that may have happened good or bad. And finally, we have uh, Steve Warren um, at Learman Flom, director of taxation, can talk about some of the tax issues and hobby issues even maybe uh, loving what you do and to become turning it into a business. And finally, we have Steve Lear of Heinz Financial, who may have a different opinion on collections and whether it's uh, a passion and not necessarily an investment. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to just give us a minute? Of, uh, I know it's not yeah. enough time. Who got a minute and a half? Who you are? Do you want me to stand up or sit down? Uh, can everybody hear? No. Yeah. no. Okay. okay, then you're going to have to stand up. Okay. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. So, this post it note was on a photo disc that I just received from an Iowa resident who attended an April 1st art and architecture tour of the Twin Cities that I led for some folks who were visiting. It reads, thank you for sharing your knowledge and passion. Those qualities connect directly to tonight's topic, passionate pursuits. Knowledge and passion drive my avocation 
which consists of three main parts, delivering public art and architecture tours through my Art Vantage service, exhibition management, and three most pertinent here, art collecting. These activities are based on a lifetime of study, on great enthusiasm for cutting edge art, on keeping an open mind, on constant clipping of newspaper articles, and on personal networking. How did art appreciation become a passion for me? The awakening came from my St. Louis Park High School art teacher, Wendell Hears. From 10th grade on, he showed us slides of great works of art and architectural monuments. This moved me so much, I wanted to study all the creative works in the universe. I earned BA and MA degrees in art history and over the years had five gallery management jobs. I pursue self-education by subscribing to periodicals and studying everything I can in print. You have some examples on your tables and I'd like them all back. <laughs> <laughs> I treasure everything in my house, 5,000 books and magazines. My 45 year tenure at, as a tour guide at Walker Art Center has helped immensely. My late father was worried about my choice of college majors and would ask me, can you make a buck at that? <laughs> yes, Dad, I made a few bucks in gallery work. My late husband, Jerry, and I began art collecting early in our marriage, one choice per year with a hiatus during the raising of three children. Today, the collection consists of about 20 important works, mostly contemporary original prints. One factor stands out, we certainly did not select artworks to match the sofa. <laughs> Later I can comment about my experience with galleries, with selling at auction, how to pick good affordable art, and issues of preservation, insurance, and record keeping. Thanks, Sarah. She knows a few things. <laughs> Bill. Good evening. I'm Bill Norberg. I started collecting coins when I was eight years old, pennies. When I was a uh, senior in high school, uh, one of my duties was to load the pop machine, which at that time was a dime. Somebody stole their grandpa's coin collection and I got my mercury dime set right down the road. <laughs> but I really didn't get passionate about stamps and coins until October 21st, 1978. A pharmacist friend of mine convinced me that I should get into collecting for various reasons. His main point was to do it for fun. Stamp collecting and coin collecting sure, at first should be fun. It is also a good investment many times, but secondary to having enjoyment. Um, my wife and I own a stamp and coin shop up in Golden Valley. Uh, next month, it'll be 25 years that uh, it's been open. Uh, I retired from selling pharmaceuticals 20 years ago, so I've been extremely active in that coin and stamp shop for the last 20. My wife ran it for the first five. Uh, we have auctions, we sell stamps. With the new coin laws, we made the decision in Minnesota that it is very difficult to sell coins. The law basically changes us to pawn shops and we have to have license and bonding. If you go on eBay and buy coins online on eBay, you will find many of them won't sell to Minnesota customers. But stamps are wide open and uh, it's one of my passions. I'll point out the most valuable thing in the world is a stamp. It just sold for $9.5 million. There's one known stamp, the British Guiana, black on magenta, so valuable that even the Queen of England cannot afford to have it in her collection. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so you were riding on your wife's coattails? <laughs> All of them. All of them. I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> Bill. We, we're standing up. Okay. Uh, we are standing up. Uh, yeah. uh, I'm Phil Rosenblum. I uh, studied art in college, and my first job out of college was as a full-time contemporary artist. And um, after about six years of that, I decided to switch careers. I ended up uh, in the insurance business, mainly because my father was in it. 
and I made a bargain with myself. And that was that I was gonna start collecting art. Uh, and since I was leaving behind the full-time practice of art, and, uh, and I started with the goal of collecting a piece of art a year, and uh, I quickly became addicted to it, and I have that gene that you were describing, <laughs> Seth. Uh, and, uh, and I just love collecting uh, contemporary art. I have a, a large collection that fills up our office and our home. And as the business grew, I became more and more happy that we had bigger office space because then we had more wall space. <laughs> um, I would say that I think uh, most art that you buy, you would have a hard time selling for more than you bought it for. So uh, I think you really have to love it. But I would say that there's a percentage of my collection that's probably worth a lot more than I paid for it. Uh, at least I hope so. so. <laughs> and uh, I am in the insurance business, so I know a lot about insuring collectibles and art. And he takes care of appliance, so we really care about them. <laughs> <laughs> and we do have, just so you know, we have a lot of blank walls in our house. Oh, good. Okay, just in case you're looking for a place to hang stuff. Brad? Uh, I'm Brad Frank. I'm a partner at Barnes & Thornburn in downtown Minneapolis. I um, we, I, I do corporate and estate planning. On the estate planning side, we work with lots of clients with different, different collections from high-end vintage cars to high-end supercars to um, very significant art collections to lots of gun collections, all, all different kinds of, of um, collectible assets. And so we help them with making some income tax decisions related to them, some insurance decisions related to them, how to gift them, figuring out if anyone in their family even wants them or wants to deal with them. And um, uh, unfortunately for the families, oftentimes we end up refereeing in a very expensive way, fights over the um, tangible personal property. So we get to see all aspects of it as it relates to moving those assets through the generations. Personally, I, I think the only thing I really collect right now, I, I have three young kids, so it appears to be like plastic right no i don't collect kids not close to you <laughs> but, but, um, but, but no i no i seem to collect um you know like plastic toys from southeast oh. asia so, so that, that, um, and i actually in in, in the last couple of years my closest friend uh, from college has become the niche he's developed for himself as a lawyer in new york is, is an art lawyer and he works with a lot of collectors galleries and um, some significant artists and we've worked together on a lot of matters and it's been fun to watch him pursue his passion because it's sort of similar to Phil. I mean, he became sort of an addicted collector and made it his practice, but I've been, I've gotten to work much more closely in the art community specifically. So that's what I think. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Steve Warren. I'm director of taxation at Lerman Flom and Company. And what I do is I head up our small business consulting area and an increasingly important part is dealing with situations clients come up with. Sometimes it is just taking an idea and seeing if it can be a viable business and maybe it'd be a hobby. Also, something important to keep in mind, sometimes you deal with situations like, okay, we have art or other collectibles. Is there a better way to structure things for tax purposes? And another thing that I do on the side, I am an adjunct professor at the University of St. Thomas's Graduate School of Business. And while I do enjoy those things, it's fair to say that my, my true passion is now getting reacquainted with my family. And although I'm not doing it so much here tonight, but just <laughs> getting reacquainted after my past few months of isolation <laughs> away from them. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Now, just to allow me to introduce this group to you, and then I have a few questions. You are in front of probably the best financial planning clients in the city. Okay? So you need to recognize these are wonderful people, caring people. Some of these we've had relationships for 30 to 35 years, so don't blow it. <laughs> Do not embarrass us. No pressure. Right? Yeah. So I do just recognize that. Uh, so that these people can have a little better picture. Who here is a current collector? And what are you collecting? Uh, art and some stamps. What are you collecting? Art. Cookbooks. Cookbooks? Art and arts and crafts. 
Okay. Okay. Who is? Go ahead. Coins. Coins. Okay. Who is recipients of somebody else's collection? Okay. For those of you who are recipients, what? What's your major concern, Russ? What's your major concern as a recipient of a collection? Identifying what we have. Identifying what you have. Okay. Anything else for those? Figuring out what we actually would like to keep. What you would like to keep. What we would like to keep. Okay, you guys getting all this? All right. I just want to make sure. Figuring out how to liquidate. So we have liquidate. All right. Okay. So here's the first question that I have. The way this is going to work is I'm going to ask a bunch of questions. I've asked the group to keep their their answers tight and quick. Uh, we're going to go until about 8:20 and then leave the last 10 minutes for your questions. Okay. So a finance financial is in the business of sending checks. That's what we do. We're into stocks, we're into bonds, we're into real estate funds, so forth and so on. So the question that I want to ask this group is what do you see as the difference between stocks and bonds and what you are here to talk about? So I'm going to have, Bill, you go first. What's the difference between stocks and bonds and stamps and coins? If you're buying stocks and bonds, I buy through Schwab and pay nine dollars a transaction. <laughs> Would okay. it be up he said I shouldn't. I should. Be, I, he said, "Be honest. Don't be political." Okay. But if you buy stamps and coins, if you buy stamps and coins, and you go to my shop or any other coin shop, and then you will have a fifty percent markup. That's the big difference between buying bonds and stocks is a small margin versus 50%. You also will pay sales tax on everything you buy in my shop. So how are you going to recuperate? 50% markup, 7.275 sales tax. You're not going to do it in your lifetime unless you're extremely lucky. So that's why I said, first off, enjoy it and then you may come out with a profit at the end. And did you want to add any last comments? <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, don't go to Schwab. <laughs> you never introduced yourself to me before. I have never been involved. <laughs> Sharon, do you want to add any kind of comments? Um, on, on what's the difference? You know, having worked in a number of commercial art galleries from like the day after I graduated college the first time and it was a very prestigious gallery and had cutting edge artists, a living artist, contemporary and I, I learned so much. It was like an additional college degree working in that gallery. It was called Dayton's Gallery 12 in the 1960s. <laughs> and it was very tempting and we were a young married couple, didn't have much money, but we took a chance on some things because working every day, you learn to love certain works for their originality, for the fact that they continue to provoke your thinking and your the myst mysterious aspects about the art that it didn't give you all its answers at one time. You kept looking at it day after day. For me, that was quality. And we did purchase some things before we had children. and. Um, I have to say, my husband was quite concerned that, especially in the area of original prints, that they would keep their value. Not so much the idea of appreciation, but not losing what we paid, because it was hard-earned money. And today, a number of those things, <laughs> they've appreciated in value. But you have to study, you have to think about it, you don't just buy it to match the sofa or the chair or the rug and um, you know everybody's noticed he said that twice <laughs> <laughs> so that, uh, when Sharon starts saying things it's, when it comes up a third time you're going to know <laughs> what to do with art you said you're in the business of sending checks sending I think checks. if you're collecting art you're going to be in the business of 
writing checks. Right. Um, and it's it's not liquid. So, you know, it's something, if you're buying it, you're going to hang on to it for a long time. And then um, hopefully, uh, maybe, you know, you, uh, in the future, you can sell it for more. So it's it, it can be an investment, but it, I wouldn't look at it at all in the same way that I'd look at a... Uh, a stock or a bond. The nice thing about it, though, is while you're holding it, you can put it up on it, on the wall and you can enjoy it, and uh, and you can't really do that with a stock or a bond. So I think the, it's one of the the great things about having uh, art is that you know it's it enhances your life and it can enhance the environment. And for me, I'm very visual, so I like having art around. Thank you. My two nerds. <laughs> <laughs> Anything in the table? Well, I'm sorry. Not, not so. Never mind. Honestly, no. I, I okay. really don't have much on point, except I, I'll just take this half minute to say that I'm really impressed with Seth, Steve, and Andy for bringing this opportunity for you guys to improve your lives, find ways for you to spend money other than with them. <laughs> Idea. <laughs> Steve, one, one way that I think it's Please. it's similar to stocks is, I mean, if you really, I, I look at it almost like a portfolio kind of a thing. So if you're really hoping that you your art appreciates, I think you need to have a, a variety of it. You know, it's like if you buy one stock, you're putting all your money in that one company and you're hoping that one's going to go up, but you could lose it all. But if you buy 100 stocks, then maybe, you know, 20% of them are going to go up and you make money on the ones that really go up. I think collecting is similar to that. So, you know, you buy 100 works of art, you're more likely that maybe the top 20% of them might appreciate. But, you know, 80% are going to do nothing for you financially. They might do a lot for you, um, you know, visually or emotionally. What did we glean from his comment? Diversification, diversification, diversification. Yes. Right? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Counting question. What accounting issues are involved in having a collection? What do the people in this room, from an accounting standpoint, what do they need to be thinking about? And Brad, I want you to, because you're next, where from a legal standpoint, what do these people need to be thinking about? So first from accounting. Depends on what you're doing. Clearly, if you're in it for a business, it's on a whole different level. But for a lot of you, for most of you, it's simply about taxes. So you need to track what you're paying for it, or if you're inheriting it, you might need to know what uh, the value was when you inherited it, or if it was a gift, what the basis was of the person who gave it to you. And then, depending on what you're doing with it, if you're improving it, that could make a difference. You know, of course, it's a very different situation if you're talking about, say, you're in the horse business, or, you know, the bottom line is it's very specific to what you're doing. It can be important to track and keep records, but there's not a single across the board statement I can give that will apply to all of you. So it may be very, dependent on your specific situation. Okay, and Brad, yeah. from a legal standpoint. Yeah, to dovetail with that, I think um, you, you first have to start deciding if whatever the collection is is gonna stay in the family. I think that's a conversation to have. For some families, that relates very closely to the value of the collection and whether or not, you know, people may hate whatever the uh, aesthetic art is, but if it's worth a lot, they kind of change their tune. <laughs> um, but, but um, and, and I think then you need to start looking at trying to plan it yourself or mom and dad to plan ahead of time, if you can then you have to decide, okay, if it's gonna stay in the family, do we transfer it now, do we transfer it later? That interplays with the income tax side of things very much, so the capital gains uh, portion. And then if it's, you know, if it's not gonna stay in the family, do we sell it now, do we sell it later, do we give it to charity? And, and there are very um, specific ways that it works to do that and, and that it works to do it effectively. And then 
the last part is if it's going to stay in the family and we're not going to give it to charity, going back to how much is it worth? And, and so if it's worth a lot of money, it's going to cause estate taxes, possibly. But we don't want to have a fire sale situation, and so how do we pay those estate taxes? And so there's there's sort of this broad array of questions that relate to the to the collection and how it's going to pass down through the generations, and and sort of working with your advisors, you can get to um, the main goal of for most people is we we know we want it to go to either charity or to the family, but we don't want to somehow benefit the IRS through all of this. And there's um, smart ways to do that and not as smart ways to do that. Right. And, and the IRS has its own opinions on it. Go ahead. Uh, as a stamp and coin dealer, I do not send you a 1099 when you sell your collection. So I defer to your lawyers and accountants on how you should handle it. But if it's a modest uh, collection, it's considered personal property, and they'll tell you where it becomes modest and not modest, and would have very limited tax uh, consequences. Okay, thank It'd you. It'd be like me. selling a, an old couch or something like that. But there is a number where the IRS will want to know about it. Do you know what that number is? It, it's actually not a defined number. If you have any kind of gain, it's subject to tax. And it does get complicated because when you're talking about a collectible, it's special. You're at a higher rate. It's at a 28% capital gains rate, so as opposed to your normal lower rate. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna put a situation on the table here in a second, but Phil, I want you to prepare for, as an insurance person, what do these people need to know about insuring their collectibles? Not yet. Let me put this situation on the table. Got a lot of people who are recipients of collectibles. So now you're thinking of selling it. Now how many of you got a analysis or evaluation of it when you received it? Okay. Is this a problem, guys? Yeah, it's gonna it's starting to change. Um, it, it, it's a problem for a lot of reasons. One is because I think somebody noted before, it makes it hard to even know if you should sell it, right? Because you don't you don't know if there's value. Um, if there was a taxable estate, there should have been, there has to have been evaluation done. But it didn't used to be that easy if you were the beneficiary to necessarily find out what that value was. They recently changed the way the estate tax return works at the federal level, where the IRS is trying to make it easier for themselves to track basis. And so as beneficiaries going forward, people are going to receive this form that tells them what the reported value was on the estate tax return. Who, um, wait, wait, wait. Who's Brad? Who's providing that information? The the executor, the people who filed the estate tax return, and okay. so it's, so the executor has to go find somebody to do a valuation of it. <laughs> we you have can. one right here. <laughs> the guy who invested Schwab right here. <laughs> yeah, they have to. And they have to. And if they don't, you try and just file the return without any valuation. The um, you know, it's like if, if you don't have a valuation, the IRS will be happy to provide you one and you won't like the answer. Okay, well, that's, well a lot of the people in this room aren't quite over $10 million. No, but the All Minnesota right. Department... No, let's bring it back down yeah. to situations. Russ, you've inherited some collectibles. All right, now you've, you've got them. First of all, what would have been the wise step for Russ to do when he inherited them? What would have been the wise thing for him to do? Well, you have to s seek out an expert, and, and and hopefully they can help you identify and evaluate and value it. Okay. Now let's say Russ has this asset that he now did get it evaluated, because we talked about this in the other room, and I actually did. I had a client who had a Stradivarius that was valued at four hundred fifty thousand dollars, and he was so kind he gave it to the current center as a contribution in what's called a gift annuity. And so what happened was every month for the rest of his life, he will get a check back. How much do you think the charitable donation was for? About 10 grand, which is what he paid for it. So he paid $10,000. It was valued at 450,000 when he gave it. He was thinking that he was gonna get $450,000 of a charitable deduction. That doesn't work with collectibles. So we brought this up. So part of the question with those of you who have 
received collectibles, if you're thinking of selling it or giving it away, the magic is getting the appraisal as soon as possible. Yeah, but there are, this is where it gets complicated. Where, where first off, you're going to decide, okay, do I want to keep it? Do I want to pass it on in the family? Do I want to donate it? If you want to donate it, whether you donate it to a charity that uses it in a related use to whatever their charitable function is, you can get a better answer than if it's unrelated. And you, mean you can get a better deduction. Yes, yes. Okay. a higher deduction, no, or maybe. You know, if it's something you're actually going to better get a better tax answer if you're an older person, let the next generation get it. And again, it's very complicated because whether it's a better answer or not may depend on whether you're subject to estate taxes. So there's no one right answer for everyone. Again, you know, you really need to sit down with your own advisor and see what's going to work best for you in your situation. Okay. Insurance. What's yeah. the deal on the insurance? So, uh, uh, under most homeowners policies, there's there's a limit for how much they'll pay for certain things. Uh, coins is one of those things. So usually, stamps, stamps coins, firearms, jewelry. So if you have valuables like that, you need to specifically list them, list them out. So you get them appraised and list them, and then. Whatever they're listed for, the insurance company will pay you that if you lose them or they're stolen or something. Other things, certain other things like, let's say, collectible furniture or artwork are covered under your contents limit. And so you don't necessarily have to list them. But if you don't list them, you, you do run a little bit of a risk that if there's a loss, then at that point you have to prove to the insurance company what they were worth. So okay. usually we advise... Question for you on the proof. What is the finest way for our clients to prove that they owned something? Well, it, it helps, let's say, if you just took a, a, a little a video like of your Bingo. contents in your home and then put that in a safe deposit box or something like that. Okay, that was... see. I asked my wife to come tonight and I said we were dealing with collectibles and I thought she might be fascinated and learning about this subject and she goes, what collectibles? I collect children. <laughs> children and grandchildren. I don't have collectibles. But I wanted Phil, do they, do, when, when a client goes to claim yep. and you've got the recording, do they take that seriously in paying off those claims? Or are there battles that go on? Well, that helps. I mean, it depends what happens. Okay. So, you know, usually, I mean, if your house burns down and there's nothing left, it really helps that it, you had that. Usually a house doesn't burn down so that there's nothing left. So usually you can sort through what's there and you can kind of inventory it. But it's much easier to inventory if you have a, a video, some kind of physical proof. But and it depends a little bit on the insurance company and, okay. and all that. Bill, did you have something you wanted to add? Uh, if you are collecting stamps and coins, there are associations like the American Philatelic Society and the American Numismatic Society. They have insurance companies that will sell insurance. I'm going to offend everybody tonight. <laughs> they have policies that are significantly lower than if you put a rider on your homeowner's insurance. Yeah. And, and I. Marsha, make sure we, uh, you know, the gift. That we right <laughs> <on. laughs> As an example, one of my friends was in the St. Peter. Uh, tornado what 10 years ago whenever that happened he called up the insurance company and said two of my three books blew away he was insured for 20,000 they gave him two-thirds of the 20,000 no questions asked so if you are into a society they can get you a better insurance product okay I have a question for the two of you no, Bill. Sharon. I have a question uh, regarding insurance. No, I'm the MC. <laughs> I'm the MC. <laughs> but okay. Regarding appraising your collectibles, is it ever okay for you 
to be the appraiser of your own valuables. If you feel you know <laughs> equal to other people in the upper Midwest and you have done all the research and can specify auction records and establish a mean. Did you see the body language? <laughs> Did you see the body language it, from the accountant? Are you experts? <laughs> well, is it ever okay if you feel you are an expert appraiser? Of not for tax purposes. Yes. <laughs> it's not okay. Not at all. For, all right. I have a question for the two of you because, and Phil, you can barge in on this because I don't know if you've done this or not. But the two of you have actually made a living out of your hobbies, out of your collectibles. Okay? So what would people here need to know about how would you turn a passion asset into a business where you actually receive money? Well, you study where you can, if it's about art collecting and selling, after, if you feel you want to get funds from your collection, you have to study which place, Christie's, Sotheby's, um, Bonhams, or auction houses. No, I'm going to ask you a different question, because yeah. you're talking about the asset. You have a company called Art Vantage. Right. Okay? So you give tours, right. exhibits, lectures, all this stuff. Do you do this for free? No. Okay, so you don't do this for free. So what what was the tipping point? Sometimes I do. <laughs> 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 okay, Sharon. No, what, I, what was the tipping point for you when you turned your passion into an income producing entity? What was see, the tipping it's, it's, point? Okay, so people have come to me because I gave a few public art tours starting in 1981, and word of mouth spread, and groups would come. I toured the Pasadena Art Alliance, the Contemporary Art Society of Albuquerque. I'm not, I don't have a website, I don't have a brochure. It just happened. I took a passion interest in public art when I traveled with my husband worldwide over the years and I would run to any listing or walking tour of art in public places and became a so-called knowledgeable person and then took an interest in our Midwest area. So it just started that way with a personal passion and I kept it up by informing myself. And, and what, like roughly what age were you? When you shifted uh -oh, you're from this, personal <laughs> question. no, no, no. no, 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 no. Now, here's the reason okay. why I'm asking the question. No, your... in the art tours, yeah. I was a middle-aged person. Okay. Yeah. Because I think everybody in this room knows that what we advocate for is that you work until you're 85. <laughs> <laughs> you're that <No>? wife. Okay. <laughs> My mother took early retirement at 79. Come on. <laughs> right. So, but part, this is why I wanted to bring this up because I think you've done a wonderful job of turning around and taking a passion, and you know, you're, you're not a, you know, you're not greedy about it. It's just you took a passion and you turned it into an income. Now I'm gathering, Bill, you did roughly the same thing, but a lot faster. I bought my first stamp on October 21st, and within a month, I was selling. I've been blessed. I knew I was a salesman when I was in high school, and I love it. It's the wheeling and dealing, and that's one of the things I love about stamps is there's no fixed price. It's a cash business, and everything is negotiable. And Steve is looking at you. Yeah. yeah. Thank God he's not my client. <laughs> I was just but, thinking, how, how's H&R Block working for you? <laughs> uh, I got my roommate from college. <laughs> but uh, in, in just a short amount of time, I started buying more than I wanted to keep. And I started running ads in the local, or not the local, in national stamp magazines, selling duck stamps, because I was a duck hunter. And as I told you at first, find something you love, duck stamps, duck hunting. I quit duck hunting and now just do stamps. And in a matter of a few years, I won't brag if I say I have the largest stamp uh, inventory in the world. 
Do you really? Oh. Duck stamps. Duck stamps? Oh. Yeah. Wow. You know, duck stamps are so much cleaner than going duck hunting. <laughs> <laughs> and you can carry them all. Yeah, really. Yeah. <laughs> Phil? The ducks are happy, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't hear what. Maybe the ducks are happy, too. Oh. <laughs> Phil, is, did, have you, you know, you're a great insurance guy, and, no, he really is. Okay, just in case anybody's wondering. <laughs> Have you converted your passion into any kind of an income producing? And again, the reason why I wanted to bring this up is, you know, we're running into people who are in their 70s and 80s and they're bored. And, you know, one of our missions is not to have any grouchy clients. <laughs> okay, we don't like grouchy clients. So the idea is, you know, finding something that you're absolutely passionate about and then getting into it. And even if it makes you five or $10,000, just the pursuit of it could be advantageous. Um, well, I do sell some artwork and I have a studio up in Northeast Minneapolis. So I, but I wouldn't say, um, you know, I'm still, I'm, that's not where you're providing educational a, funds I'm, for your kids? Yes. I'm, okay. I'm supporting my lifestyle at the insurance business. Okay. But uh, yeah, I mean, I do do some. Okay. Some selling as well. I have a question for Brett. I got about five minutes left of questions. What's the danger of being a collectible dying with the collection? What's the danger? Depends. I, I think a lot of that may be driven by how it's worth, how much it's worth. I think. Say it's worth fifty to a hundred thousand. Let's go with that example. Yeah, I mean, I think a, a, a major danger is if the people who receive it don't want it, it may get sold for less than it's worth. I mean, I think there's, you know, the whole, again, fire sale or selling a block of a specific type of art or, or other collectible. I think that's an overall danger to the family. Um, yeah, I think um, it can also cause a lot of strife in, in any given family if there's strong disagreement if, if whoever died didn't do a good job of themselves saying where it should go um if it just says my kids divvy everything up uh they may not let me ask this additional question is putting masking tape with a kid's name on the back of an item does that work or it not? does work that does work mm -hmm. okay just everybody got that so, Don, you know that really expensive train that you have? Just put my name right on it. <laughs> Steve <laughs> Lear. What? What did you say? Isn't that big yeah, right. Jimmy yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I got nailed on that one. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a lot. It's, you know, uh, if, if you have a will, it says, you know, my, my stuff, my tangible personal property goes usually to, you know, surviving spouse and they're gone to the kids uh, unless I have a separate writing. And the separate writing can be as informal as a piece of tape with, that you can tell is the person's handwriting. We've had them on napkins. Um, it's, uh, it's pretty informal. Um, and, and as I, I, you know, in my experience, if the kids, you know, in a family have been waiting 50 years to have a fight, um, <laughs> but they're gonna have a fight and it's gonna be over the tangible personal problem. It's usually where the real war is. Anybody want to add anything to that? Well, yeah, I'll just see your attorney and get it straightened out first because as I was just whispering to Brad, I've had it a few times where there's been major arguments because one kid gets there first and takes what he or she wants before the other one has the opportunity. So if you see your attorney and get it in writing first, you're going to help things with the next generation as far as getting along and doing what you want. Yeah, I had, I'd say two years ago, I had a case where we had the siblings spent probably $45,000 on lawyers on fighting over stuff that was probably worth $12,000. I, I think you do your children a big favor by getting that all straightened out ahead of time. Hey, Bill, do you want to add anything? Bill or Sharon, do you want to add anything to these stories? Um, a, a client uh, brother made it to mom's estate when she was downsizing and she got two painting or he got two paintings that were worth 10 to 15 million dollars he just got a u-haul trailer full of all the silverware 
he still hates his brother. <laughs> um, and, and he's somebody I work with every day. Okay. Now, we, we have a, Vicki, you'll be next. Um, we have a situation right now in our city where this is potentially going to turn into a really big thing. And with Prince's death, um, for, for me personally, because I was friends with his drummer, I was friends with his uh, organ player, my mom did his 24th and 25th birthday in throwing the parties, and he was like one of us. I mean, he went to Central, he was 57 years old. And it's, it's, it's absolutely a crime, so, well, I can't say it's a crime, it's a tragedy that this man who had so many collectibles, so many things that are going to be very valuable, and we really don't have any masking tape on anything. And all I can yeah, think real. of, all I can think of of what happened with Prince, if this pl plays out, is that he could have set up the school districts in the Twin Cities to having funds that could have paid for music teachers for years and years and years. And it would have been incredibly simple, wouldn't it, have, Brad? Absolutely. It would have been what, a four page document? I mean, that was really all he wanted to do. Yeah. That's all he wanted to do. It could have been a four page document that says anything that I own goes to this foundation for the purpose of sending money to school districts to promote music education. So, this. Thank you for bringing this up and answering that question. Nikki. It's not the intrinsic value that caused the problem. I had a, a matter where the folks argued for weeks over Mom's autograph book. And was it Prince in the autograph book? <laughs> 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 but, but it's not the, that it was so valuable. It just it meant something to one of the kids. That's right. And the other one was spiteful. So you designate. Okay. It, was it is eight twenty-one. Questions? Yes. For the valuation thing, it seems like that can be complicated because you might want a low value for the estate taxes, but then you want a high value for your insurance guy, right? <laughs> <laughs> Let, let, me, let me repeat the question so that this group knows that you heard everything. What's the dilemma between wanting a low valuation for estate tax planning purposes and a high valuation for insurance purposes? Which of those valuations really stands out? Phil and Brett. Well, well, Steve. For insurance, we don't get involved in the taxes, so um, we really want you to value it at whatever it would cost to replace it. And certain things are irreplaceable, but uh, but a lot of things are replaceable. So, or, or more or less, you can get something that's very similar. So the- Well, duck stamps aren't. <laughs> but you can- There's at least a million and a half of every one. Okay, never mind. They're very replaceable. So, you know, uh, like- Everybody certain, needs them, you know where to go. Certain works of art are, um, yeah, are unique, but a lot of them are like prints that you yeah. could get a the same print, you know, different um, or a different number, um, or you could get a similar unique piece from the same artist or something. So, it, I mean, for insurance, you want to value it at what, whatever it would cost you to replace it. So, should you get two valuations done? I I don't have an opinion on that. But go ahead. <laughs> Now, you're, <laughs> you're, you need to use a qualified expert in the field who's certified, and there are other strategies you could use, you know, so you need a real, true value, which would also work for replacement. But maybe you put it in a, in a family limited LLC or limited liability company or partnership and you can take a discount. You know, there are other ways where you can reduce the value by strategizing that go beyond just what the appraiser says. And it depends what the asset is. If it's art in particular, the IRS um, pays very close attention to art valuations, and they have um, this art appraisal board that they use of experts also for very high value items, that there are a lot of really interesting cases that are involved because it's about sort of cool art or weird art or whatever, but the IRS knows that there's this very um, broad 
uh, spectrum of, of how valuations can come in, and so they pay close attention to the art ones in particular. Sure. Did well, you, uh, I, did you have a question? Yeah, it is. I agree with all these opinions, and you know, in evaluating my own and <laughs> raising my own. <laughs> Sharon, let's try this. <laughs> <laughs> I do a lot of study, and I really do a lot of study, and study very fine print auction records over a number of years, and I establish a mean. It's a middle point for the valuations. It's halfway between what Phil is saying and other commentary here, and I'm, you know, I'm satisfied with that, but I guess I will have to get back to my insurance business. <laughs> find another expert, but I mean, something in the no, middle. Are you insuring her? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. He's shaking, he's shaking. <laughs> I mean, to give, give you peace of mind, something in the middle that you write down on paper for your general purposes would probably do it. So we follow that question for a minute? Bill mentioned earlier, if you buy coins from him, you pay a 50% markup. So the replacement value for insurance is 50% more than I can sell it for if I want to sell it. Unless so it's, now, a, unless it's a valuable me, you item. You tax me on what I can get out of it, right? So, so there's a different value than the appraisal value, or than the replacement value. Well, you're talking about what is fair market value. Right, but he's not going to charge me fair market no, value fair market. if I want to buy another one. So I need more money from my insurance company to be able to buy another one than fair market value. Well, here's how I'm interpreting the question. Phil, you talked about replacement costs, and he's talking about fair market value. So from an insurance standpoint, what do you think the claims elements are? Or, yeah, let's start there. It depends a little bit on the insurance company. but. Usually, if you list out, here's the value that I'm insuring it for, they'll just write you a check for whatever you listed out as a value. But some insurance companies will pay you up to 150% of that value if you can show them that you actually went out and replaced it with like kind and quality. So if you, let's say you have a coin and you have it valued at $5,000 and you and uh, the insurance company's gonna pay you five and then you, you say, well, no, I went to Bill and I, and I tried to buy it, and, yeah, <laughs> and he marked it up. It cost me seven to get the exact same coin I, I had. Uh, some insurance companies will pay you the seven. Some will just pay you the five. I mean, it depends the a little bit. The important part of that question, though, is what is the IRS going to do to me on capital gains? No. Are they going to say it's worth seven even though it was only worth five? <laughs> it's what your fair market value is. And insurance, it could be different. You know, if you've got a replacement value policy, then yes, maybe you'd actually be able to get more yeah. and go to someone like Bill and line his pockets. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I can do it. <laughs> All right, other questions? Other questions? Yes. A question about art and, and local artists. I mean, obviously, the Twin Cities, there's a pretty vibrant local art community, but from your experience, does, does local art you know, given the fact you may not make a lot of money collecting art, but at least art from local artists, does it generally hold its value or not as much because they don't have the reputation that you're buying at Renoir or Monet? Or, you know. <laughs> Can I add to that question? Two of you? Yeah. Who, who? Sharon and Phil. Yeah. Who are the local artists that would be considered to be valuable besides you? Uh, there, there are. Um, I, I think there's a limited number of local artists who you could say are collectible and and would definitely hold their value. But there's a few. Uh, you know, just a couple of names: David Rathman, Alex South, Todd Norstan. I mean, there's a, there's a few that that have a little bit of a you know, a national presence. Um, so right now, you know, they're selling, but it's really hard to know. So they could, they might be doing okay now and then later on, not, not so well. I think you're, you're rolling the dice more. But the, but the truth, the truth is you can buy some fantastic local art that would, that you'd be really happy with and it's less expensive. Uh, but it's more of a long shot that in the future you'd be able to sell it for more than you paid for it or even sell it for as much as you paid for it. Sharon, do you want to add to that? Well, there there have been local artists who have had 
renowned in the renowned in the upper Midwest and have had commissions, public art, um, paintings, all shows. And as soon as they die, I mean, the widows are left with, <laughs> you know, hundreds of these paintings, and I have seen that they cannot get any funds from them. So. I mean, there, late, uh, recently, uh, a Minnesota artist passed away, his name uh, Charles Biederman, and they've been selling off his estate. And that, that art's worth something, and it's been selling. You know, one of the local galleries here has been selling it off. And okay, Bill, did you have something you wanted to well, add? Well, uh, duck stamps, <laughs> the three Houtman brothers uh, are famous throughout the country because they've won more awards. And uh, wildlife art peaked in 2000, 2001, and it has plummeted dramatically. Um, things that would have brought uh, seven, $800 for a piece, a print, now are 60, 70, $80. So it depends on the field, and you know I'm very familiar with the wildlife uh, area. Uh, so. Okay, I'd like to, more questions? Or are you just showing me the pen? <laughs> <laughs> Auntie Reba. <laughs> My claim to fame. Uh, who, if you own um, local artists who are well known, who would you take? How would you go about selling it? Or who would you take it to? Good question. I, the question was if you have art that you want to sell, where would you go? I think it really depends on who the artist is, so uh, and you know what genre. So uh, there's like, for example, uh, talking about Bud Weinstein Gallery. Bud, are you talking about Bud, Bud? Chapman? Chapman? Bud Chapman. Golf artist. Oh. Okay. No, I don't have him. Okay. So like Weinstein Gallery in town is a very good gallery, but they sell mostly photography and it's contemporary. So you know they might not be good if you're trying to, and they might not be good if you're trying to sell like a a painting that's um, mid-century or something. So, uh, sure. Sharon might know. Uh -huh. Wheeling <laughs> and dealing. <Yeah. laughs> it's not on here. <laughs> Weaving, have you tried? Okay. Okay. There, there's a show at the MIA right now. There's an exhibition at the MIA called State of the Art. The, um, the Crystal Bridges Museum in Arkansas sent curators all across the entire country to every state in the Union to ascertain who are the rising stars, emerging artists in every state. There's a show at the Institute right now. One Minnesota artist was selected, Chris Larson. He's a video artist. I mean, he does other things, sculpture, wooden constructions. And this is a video of one of his constructions in his studio, and it's magnificent. But they found one artist in Minnesota where other states had a number of artists. So that was their opinion. So when you say, how do you buy and sell local, you have to just expose yourself to every gallery show you can, every museum show, if you want to buy learn to love it, live with it, enjoy it, and, and I, I guess I've not. Already, and I've, what? Already done, I've already done that. No, 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 it makes sure that it's, it's not hard to at your couch. <laughs> if you want to if you want to sell it, it's hard. It's really hard to sell it. But I might start just, you know, going on the internet and Googling that artist and finding uh, out if there's galleries in the, in the world or in the country that represent that artist. And that would be where I would start. It's 8.30, so what I'm going to ask to, to be, Bill wanted to go home. No, I'm going to the wine and the beer. <laughs> he wanted to get to the wine and beer. <laughs> but they'll be hanging around here and don't hesitate to ask me any questions. But there's a couple people I want to thank, and then I just want to close and thank you. Tyler, you want to stand up and get out of the corner? And you can always thank Marsha for the good food. Okay. <laughs> but, um, then the people in the office who've helped us you know, promote and, and organize these. Uh, 
the leader of the marketing aspects of the company is Seth Meisner. And this was Seth's idea. He thought it was a great idea. And it really does tie into the theme of a fight because when I said we're not really looking for grouchy clients, I meant. Okay. And we hope that having this kind of knowledge and this kind of joy and that you can turn around and you can actually make a living or some extra dollars so you can go on extra trips, anything of that sort, you can help your kids, you can help your grandkids. We think that this all makes a difference and it makes for a great and joyful life. So we really do appreciate the five of you for being here, for doing a great job of not embarrassing a finance. <laughs> <laughs> and um, to you as always, Andy, Andy, um, spend a little time, he's fine, is he fine? Is Andy fine? Is Andy fine? Okay. Just have a no, slight very day, he's okay. <laughs> but I know that on behalf of everybody at Affiance, we truly do believe that we have the finest clients in town. And that there, it's just a remarkable group of people because we get to see you guys often enough and talk to you and find out what's important and what's not important. And it is, um, it, it's just such a pleasure. I've been doing this now for 36 years, and I can't tell you how. I, well, I can tell you how interesting it is to come to the office every day. It still blows me away how interesting it is to come to the office every day. And the only reason why is because of you. So we thank you very much for your continued confidence. And feel free to ask any of these people any questions. And we have more food. <laughs> and we have wine and beer. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>